Good morning, class. Good morning, Brother Keith. Hi, I'm Keith Moore, and we welcome you to Faith School. Faith School is the place where my spirit is fed, my faith grows stronger, and I learn how to be an overcomer. Uh, we, a big part of faith is saying, the, the Lord is the high priest of, of our confession. And that's one of the reasons we want to start the class off with releasing faith, that we're going to get something out of the class. Uh, the class is going to make a difference. So get your Bible, something to make a note with. Come on into the classroom and sit right here by faith in this seat. And let's believe the Lord to give us utterance and answers for right now. Father, we thank you so much. We so appreciate all the prayers you have already answered and all the things you have done to sustain us to this present hour. And we do not blame you for the bad things that people have done and, and the enemy has done. We give you the glory for the good things that we enjoy because we know and are convinced you are good. You're a good God. We ask you for help today. Feed us, strengthen us, quicken us, give us answers. We ask for it in Jesus' name <clears throat> and ears to hear it we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Turn, please, to uh, Matthew 8 and also to Luke 7 in our great textbook, the Bible, continuing our study uh, that we're calling Faith for Healing. We're taking one by one the uh, accounts of healing, individual accounts of healing in the ministry of Jesus. We studied the healing of the leper, the healing of Peter's mother-in-law, the healing of the paralyzed man, the healing of the nobleman's son. We studied the healing of the man with the withered hand. And now we're down to number six, the healing of the centurion's servant. It's recorded in both Matthew and Luke. And um, we'll, at some point, we'll make it to, through both of these because one adds details that the other one didn't and vice versa. In Matthew 8, and I'm going to read this to you from a different translation today. Um, I'm going to start off in the, the Weiss translation, and I think I'll wind up in the, the Living Bible. But just uh, some of the words here, I think it'll draw your attention to some things. Matthew 8 and 1 in the Weiss, he says, Having come down from the mountain, great crowds followed him. And behold, a leper having come fell upon his knees and touched the ground with his forehead in an expression of profound reverence before him, saying, Master, in the event that you may be having a heartfelt desire, you are able to cleanse me. And having stretched out his hand, he touched him, saying, I am desiring it from all my heart. Be cleansed at once. And immediately his leprosy was cured by being cleansed away. Hallelujah. How many believe the Lord is the same yesterday, today, and forever? If he said, I will, or as like we says, I'm desiring it with all my heart. If he, if he desired it then, he desires it now. Now in the Living Bible, verse 5, Matthew 8, 5, I'm reading the Living Bible now. When Jesus arrived in Capernaum, a Roman army captain came and pled with him to come to his home and heal his servant boy, who was in bed, paralyzed, and racked with pain. Yes, Jesus said, I will come and heal him. Verse 8, the officer said, Sir, I am not worthy to have you in my home, and it isn't necessary for you to come. If you will only stand here and say, Be healed, my servant will get well. I know because I am under the authority of my superior officers, and I have authority over my soldiers. And I say to one, go, and he goes. And to another, come, 
and he comes. And to my slave boy, do this or that, and he does it. And I know you have authority to tell his sickness to go, and it will go. Jesus stood there amazed. Turning to the crowd, he said, I haven't seen faith like this in all the land of Israel. Hallelujah. And I tell you this, that many Gentiles shall come from all over the world and sit down in the kingdom of heaven with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and many an Israelite, those for whom the kingdom was prepared, shall be cast into outer darkness into the place of weeping and torment. Then Jesus said to the Roman officer, go on home. What you have believed has happened. And the boy was healed from that same hour. What you see when, when he said uh, there'd be many that would come from uh, the east and west and different places and sit down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And, but there would be those who were originally of the kingdom that would not be. They'd be cast out. And why would he say that in connection with this? Because of finding faith where you don't expect and not finding faith where you think you would. That's what this passage is about. This centurion is not a preacher. He's not a seminary, Bible school student. He is a man who has known violence. He's a soldier. And uh, the Roman Empire was the mightiest empire in the world. And they didn't get to be that just through peaceful negotiations. They conquered peoples forcibly. And one of the reasons they kept winning battle after battle is they had the most disciplined, most effective fighting force in the world. And you didn't get to be an officer in this army by being weak or by being undisciplined or who wouldn't follow orders. And that's what he says. And man, it's just, it just opens up faith to you if you'll let it. Now see, so many times when people think spiritual things, they think they have nothing to do with natural things. But here, the person who has faith that Jesus marvels over, more than his own team, his staff, and anybody in the, any priest or, or rabbi or Levite in the whole nation, is a man who understands the chain of command. Can you see this class? He understands authority and submission. Now in our society, submission's like a bad word. I mean, people think, oh, submit. Oh, no, no, you know, let's don't. You, we've developed beyond that primitive concept. Well, then you've got out beyond God because he's never changed. And if you don't understand submission and authority, you won't walk in great faith. Can you see they're connected? Can you see this or not, class? They are connected. I see so many times people are thinking if it's spiritual, it'd have to be, you know, uh, reading the word, studying the word or praying or preaching or teaching. No, it's not a man with a teaching background <laughs> who Jesus said has great. That doesn't mean that somebody that was a preacher couldn't have had the same thing, but somehow they've missed it. And you'll see another part of this is when Jesus uh, says, I will come, I'll come and healing. What, what's the man's response? Look at me in ver look with me rather in verse eight. Jesus said, "I'll come and heal him." Now, most people, if the Lord said that to them, what would they say? All right. Great, <laughs> right? Come on, right? Jesus coming to my house? Mm -hmm. Yes, come. We saw the in in the healing of the nobleman's son recently in that study, a very different situation from this. 
the Lord actually said to him, unless you see something, you won't believe. And his emphasis was to get Jesus to come to his house. And on that time, uh, Jesus, it was his will for the, uh, his son to be healed, but it wasn't his will to do it the way he wanted it done. He wanted to see Jesus, touch him, pray for him. And here, Jesus offers to do that. He offers to come to this officer's house. I guess go in the room. I guess either touch or pray for the, the servant. And what, is it, what does this man say? This officer? No. No, you don't need to. Now let's just look right here. This is great faith. You don't need to. I don't need to see you come to my house. I don't need to hear you pray a prayer. I don't need to see you lay hands on him. All I need, sir, is a faith command. <laughs> That's, he, he's acknowledging, I understand authority, he says. That's his life. There was a point back years ago he was a private, if you will. He was a, a new recruit, whatever. And he obviously showed himself courageous in battle. That means he either kill or be killed. And it wasn't sitting in a comfortable spot somewhere uh, pushing a button or even pulling a trigger. You had to get up close and personal with a blade. And... He has been through mud and blood. But his life is one of orders and carrying out orders and obeying orders. And the, the reason they had such discipline in their ranks is because it, um, disobeying was not permitted. It was not allowed. It was not tolerated for fear that it would weaken the ranks. You got one guy disobeying, next thing you got 20 guys disobeying, next thing you got the thing fall, falling apart. And so they had the, everybody ingrained that if we say charge, you don't think about not charging. If it looks to be into certain death, that's what you do. You charge right into death. And because of that, they won and they won and they won. Now, they lost soldiers. They lost people, but they won. And here's a man who's come up through the ranks, and now he's an officer over a hundred. And he is, you know, he's receiving orders and he's giving orders. When he gets his orders, he doesn't question them. And when he gives orders, they are not questioned. And he takes that and applies it to Jesus. <laughs> Can you see that? It's just as simple as that. He takes that and applies it to Jesus and said, my superiors have authority over me. I've got authority over my men and my servants. And what he said, he has obviously, if you read Luke and this, it said he heard about Jesus. Well, it had come to his attention either people he knew or maybe he saw something from a distance. He had heard about healings and deliverances and he, he concluded in his heart, this man has authority over sickness and disease. He has authority over bad spirits. And so he knows all I need is if, he can, if he'd give me a command because he has authority. Yeah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And that's what Jesus marveled about. The realities of the things in God are not religious like people imagine them to be. And so much of what people think is spiritual is not. Spiritual is real. It's reality. And here's a man who had had a good dose of reality <laughs> in war and in life. But he saw something that was real, just as real as his authority. He has authority. 
And so the emphasis in this healing is authority and understanding that authority and the spoken word. One of the things that you don't see, and this is so, uh, such a big part of this, is when the Lord told him, I will come. I'll come and heal him. And like we said, who wouldn't receive that? <laughs> who wouldn't say, yes, yes, Lord, come. It's part of why he is in the book as one who had great faith. Let me read this to you from this translation and then another couple of translations. He said, I'm not worthy to have you in my home. Now we today, word in faith circles, we don't like that phrase because the Lord helped us to learn that we are not unworthy before him. We've been made worthy and yet there is a sense this applies to us still. What do you mean? People say, well, I'm the righteousness of God. Don't leave off that last phrase. In Christ. You're the righteousness of God in Christ. It's not your righteousness. It's His. And you received it. You, you've received it as yours, but it's His. It's His. And in yourself, you are not worthy. Based on what you have done, you don't deserve it. And this is a big interference with faith. If you get to thinking the Lord should heal me because I'm a good Christian, because I've done good things. Now look with me, I'm going to read this to you from uh, Luke's account now. And uh, I'm going to read this as well in the uh, Living Bible, Luke 7 and 1. It said, when Jesus had finished his sermon, he went back into the city of Capernaum. Just at that time, the highly prized slave of a Roman army captain was sick and near death. When the captain heard about Jesus, he sent some respected Jewish elders. The Weiss translation says he sent them on a mission to him to ask him to come and heal his slave. So they begin pleading earnestly with Jesus to come with them and help the man. They told him what a wonderful person the captain was. And I'm reading the Living Bible now. They said, these elders of the Jews, they said, if anyone deserves your help, it's he. They said, for he loves the Jews and even paid personally to build us a synagogue. So what are they saying? He deserves for you to do this. And what did the, the centurion say? I don't deserve for you to do this. In, in verse 6, I'm still reading the Living Bible. Jesus went with them. But just before arriving at the house, the captain sent some friends to say, Sir, don't inconvenience yourself by coming to my home. I'm not worthy of any such honor or even to come and meet you. Did you hear that? I'm not worthy of any such honor or even to come and meet you. I believe it's the Phillips that said it like this. I'm not important enough for you to come to my house. Now, think about the situation. This Rome is occupying this country. They are in total control. And that means the soldiers and the military and the officers are in control. They can do basically what they want to do. Jesus, from the natural, is a carpenter's son and a traveling minister, prophet. Now we know he's the Messiah, but most of them didn't know. And he could have required Jesus to come militarily. He could have, remember he said, I say to my soldier, go, and he goes, and to this one, do it. He could have sent uh, somebody to get him and bring him to his house. But 
he, the reason he's in the book, he knew that'd be disrespectful. And I want you to notice what he didn't do. He didn't try to send request for Jesus through the government, through his superiors. Now you might say, well, why bring that up? Well, in 2 Kings, that's what happened uh, with uh, the prophet. There was a maid that was captured, and Naaman, the Syrian commander of all the forces, was leprous. And the maid said to him, there's a prophet in Israel that could get you healed. And they believed it enough. He has, I mean, he's a commander over all the military in that country. And so he makes request to the king, and the king sends and makes request to the king of Israel. And they get all upset because the king there says, look what he's doing. He's trying to start a war. What does he think? I can heal this guy? But see, he didn't understand He's respecting natural authority, and natural authority can't heal him. And during the midst of that, the prophet sent to the king of Israel and said, send him over here. (laughs) Send him over here, and he'll know that there's a prophet, there's a God in Israel. And that's when Naaman got healed. But you see that this officer did not try to go through natural authority channel because he knew they didn't have that they couldn't heal their self much less him and his people so he shows respect everybody say respect. respect oh man this is so big he shows honor to the man of god now i don't think he knew that jesus was the messiah probably at this point but He believed he's a man of God. He believed, prophet probably, he believed he had spiritual authority and was walking in it. And he showed him the utmost respect. And he said, I'm not important enough for you to come. Uh, The God's word in the NIV says, Sir, I don't deserve to have you come into my house. But just give a command, and my servant will be healed. Later on, it said, that's why I did not come to you in person. Now, we're going to get into this more later, because if you read Matthew's account, it sounds like the centurion came to him personally. If you read Luke's account, you find out he never saw Jesus face to face. And that's why you have some people say, well, look, there's... There's disagreement. No, that's just something you didn't understand. This is so beautiful why the Lord did this way because the whole thing is about delegated authority. Can you see that? The whole, this whole story is about delegated authority. And that's we'll get to that, I think, at some point. But... This word that's, when he says, I'm not worthy, there's actually two words used in this text translated that. One of them means, I'm not entitled. I'm not entitled. And this word, oh boy, it's it's part of the pride and selfish fallen nature throughout the whole world. You've got folks right and left who think they're entitled to help and favor and all kind of things. But here's the problem. With God, everything is by grace. And if it's by grace, you don't deserve it. You're not entitled. If you deserve it, It can't be by grace. And if you think you deserve something, you've made it impossible for someone to be gracious to you. Why would you say that? Let me read some some scriptures and just remind you of this. Is there an issue of people feeling entitled? Oh, man. 
Oh, man. Oh, it's everywhere. It's everywhere. And people don't stop to think, well, well I, I, th- I deserve this. Why? Because you're alive? Because you're breathing? Why is something owed to you? You hear people say, well, everybody's owed a good life. Really? Why? Who owes it to them? Why? It is God's will. But why is it owed to you to have a, well, everybody, you know, is owed a a good job and, and, and good pay and everybody's owed a good place to live. Why are you owed a good place? And if you think you are owed all these things, then no one can be gracious to you. Why, why say that, brother? Because if they did it for you, you wouldn't even be thankful. You think it's owed to you. You think you deserve it. So it can't be a gift. L- listen to uh, Romans 11 and 6. He said, if it's by grace then it's no more of works. Otherwise, grace is no more grace. If it's works, then it's not grace. Otherwise, work is not work. What does it mean? If you deserve it, it can't be a gift. If it's a gift, you can't have earned it. You can't. And that's how this man approaches Jesus. Now, see, he is a good man. The, The elders of the Jews they gladly went and represented him to Jesus and even told Jesus that he deserved it. Why? They said he built us a synagogue out of his own pocket, out of his personal money. And he loves the Jews. He had respect. But when it comes down to him thinking he deserves it, he said, no, no, sir. And he's thinking about, I'm a soldier, I'm a man of violence and blood and and no, you don't need to come to my house. I, I'm not entitled to anything from you. But if you would, sir, speak the word. I know you have authority. <laughs> and my servant's in a bad way. And if you would speak. Are you seeing the characteristics of great faith? There's a humility. A lot of humility. There's respect. A lot of respect. That is a direct part of great faith. Hallelujah. And we're out of time. (laughs) Said out loud, I live by faith. I walk by faith. I overcome this world by faith. I'm strong in faith, giving glory to God. Come back tomorrow. We need to continue with this. We'll see you next time here in Faith School. Thank you for joining us at Faith School. Class is dismissed for today, but you can watch this and other episodes of Faith School free of charge at faithschool.org. For more information, visit our website or call us at 941-702-7390.